everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Catherine Mangi Ward. I'm the managing editor of Reason Magazine. And uh, I'm just going to kind of get us started with a few questions and then uh, looking forward to taking questions from the audience. So uh, the death of money sounds pretty delightfully apocalyptic. Um, can you uh, kind of lay out what that looks like? Uh, I know that you've said in other interviews that, you know, this book is actually about what happens after that and, and the kind of reformation. But, but first, like, lay it on us. How bad is it going to be? Well, thank you, Catherine. And I'd like to thank uh, Garrett also for the introduction and the Charles Koch Institute and Reason Magazine for hosting us tonight. So very happy to, to be here. It's a great event and a great group. And I always love uh, any occasion to be back in Washington. So um, the bad news is that all of the blunders have already been made. We're just waiting for the catalyst. So the, the problems are, are kind of baked into the pie and the metaphor I use a lot. But I want to make it clear when I talk metaphorically, it's not really a metaphor, metaphor because the dynamics, the mathematics, and, and the, the complex interactions in various phenomena are the same. Um, so I'll use the, um, the snowflake and the avalanche, which I talk about in my book. Um, you know, you're on a mountainside and you're watching uh, the snow build up and it builds up and it's windswept and it's on an overhang and it's unstable and anyone with any experience knows that this is an avalanche in the making. The snow's gonna, not gonna stay here, it's gonna fall down. So a, a snowflake comes along and it perturbs a few other snowflakes and that starts a little momentum and that creates a slide and then a larger chute. And then the whole thing comes loose and the avalanche comes down and it kills some skiers and buries the village below and that's your disaster. Now, a couple things. Number one, who do you blame? Do you blame the snowflake or do you blame the unstable snowpack? I would submit that the unstable snowpack is your problem. Because if it wasn't one snowflake, it would be another, maybe one the day before, or one the day after. It doesn't really matter. The snowflake doesn't matter. It's going to come. What matters is the fact that you have a very unstable system. And as applied to finance, because that's what we're, we're here to talk about, we have exactly the same situation. The, the snowpack, if you will, is the, is the complex interactions, uh, what, what scientists call the density function of all the financial contracts and financial institutions in the system today. In 2008, there's not a person in the room who didn't hear about too big to fail ad nauseum, too big to fail, too big to fail. Well, today, in 2014, the five largest banks in the United States are bigger than they were in 2008. They own a larger percentage of the assets of the banking system. Their derivatives books, uh, books are much bigger. So everything that was too big to fail in 2008 is bigger and more dangerous today. Um, and you know we all know that Dodd-Frank was supposed to eliminate too big to fail. It did not eliminate too big to fail. What it did, it institutionalized too big to fail. It really made too big to fail a manageable statutory policy as opposed to something that you, know, you could possibly debate. Um, and so that's the, that's the snowpack. So at this point, we're just waiting for the snowflake. We're waiting for the catalyst that will cause this uh, catastrophe to, to come tumbling down. Now, one difference between a natural system such as an avalanche and a human-based system such as the financial system is that there is the ability to intervene. Imagine a, an avalanche is coming down and somehow a 10-foot steel fence you know, popped out of the mountain and stopped the avalanche. Well, you could imagine something like that. They don't exist in the real world. But, um, but you could picture something like that. That was the role of the Fed. In other words, this cascade that happened in 2008 was underway. Uh, Morgan Stanley was days away from failure. After Lehman, after AIG, Morgan Stanley would have been next. They were days away. Goldman Sachs would have failed after that then Citibank, then Bank of America. Who knows about JP Morgan? Maybe, maybe not. But in all likelihood, yes, that all the major banks would have failed. Um, that didn't happen. And we know why, because the Fed was the fence. It popped up and said, no, we are now going to guarantee every bank deposit in the United States, regardless of uh, size. There's been a, a $250,000 limit. When I say the Fed, I'm including the FDIC and the Treasury and OCC and all the government agencies combined. We're going to guarantee every bank deposit in the United States. We're going to guarantee every money market fund in the United States. Uh, we will not only start printing money by the trillions, but they engaged in tens of trillions of dollars of, at the time, undisclosed swap arrangements with the European Central Bank because the European banks had dollar liabilities. They owed dollars to U.S. money market funds. The European Central Bank 
can print euros, but they can't print dollars. So they couldn't bail out their own banks because they didn't have dollars. So what they did, they printed up a bunch of euros, the Fed printed up a bunch of dollars, they swapped the euros for the dollars, we still have the euros, they got the dollars, they used that to bail out their banks. And this is by the tens of trillions. So you add up all the guarantees, all the money printing, all the swaps that went into this is far beyond what you see on the Fed balance sheet. Much of that is still in place, not all of it, some of it's been unwound, but it's all still in place that, to a great extent. The banks are larger, so the whole thing is worse and more dangerous than it was. We're just waiting for that snowflake or, or the catalyst. And then uh, one of the questions I get most frequently is, well, what would it be? You know, and then uh, another variation on the question is, uh, hey, Jim, I'd like you to call me at 3.30 the day before the system implodes, because then I'll, I'll sell my stocks and buy some gold, and I'll be good to go. And I explain to people it doesn't work that way. Um, you won't know what it is. I mean, it could be a number of things. It could be the failure of a bullion bank to deliver physical gold on demand. It could be the failure of a financial institution, uh, such as the, you know, the MF Global that I think we're all familiar with. It could be a prominent suicide. It could be a natural disaster. It could be a lot of things. It doesn't matter. It's coming and the, the, the disaster is already baked into the pie and it's actually worse. The point I make, and I just kind of get back to the death of money and, and where the book ends up, is that the next time it happens, it'll be bigger than the Fed. The Fed did truncate the disaster the last time. I mean, they did. These other banks would have failed. They didn't, so you have to give the Fed credit uh, for truncating it, although I like to say, um, you know, this, uh, this cult of Bernanke is hero. Uh, to me, he's a guy who sets your house on fire and then shows up with a fire hose and offers to put it out. I don't, I don't give much credit for being a hero in a disaster that he caused, he and others. Um, but it will be bigger than the Fed because all the policy that I described, that $4 trillion approximately of money printing, is still there. So what happens the next time there's a liquidity crisis of the kind we had in 2008, except um, you know, under, you know, using my analysis, my dynamic um, uh, systems analysis, it'll be much worse. So now you have a worse liquidity crisis than we had in 2008. The Fed did everything I just described to put out the last one. That's still there. What are they going to do next time? Print eight trillion, 12 trillion? There is some, there actually is not a legal limit, but there is some confidence limit or political limit on what they can do. And that crisis is going to be bigger than the ability of the central banks to snuff it out because they've all trashed their balance sheets. Uh, and there's only one clean balance sheet left in the world, which is the IMF. The Fed is leveraged about 80 to 1. Uh, it's insolvent on a mark-to-market -market basis. Um, and you don't have to take my word for, for that. I've had a recent discussion with an FOMC member. You know, can't mention the name, Chatham House Rules, but the, the substance of the discussion was, um, uh, I said to this individual, you know, the Fed's insolvent. I like to, it was a dinner, I like to be a little provocative if I can. Um, on a mark-to-market -market basis, I said, I know you don't mark your balance sheet to market, but if you did, it would be insolvent. And the individual said, no, we're not. Uh, no one's done that calculation. I said, well, actually, I've done it, and I think others have done it. And the person demurred a little bit and said, well, uh, uh, maybe. And then I just stared at this individual and, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't let the person off the mat. And finally, the individual said, well, we are, but it doesn't matter. Central banks don't need capital. Um, that was an exact quote. Uh, Senator Paul has already uh, Rand Paul, uh, likely presidential candidate in 2016, has already started to talk about the insolvency of the Fed. If you think bailing out banks in 2008 was unpopular, wait till we have to bail out the Fed. Um, so th the point is, they're at that they're at the outer limit of what they can do, in my view. Uh, the IMF has only leveraged three to one versus 80 to one for the Fed, and so the liquidity is going to come from the IMF, but they can't print dollars. They can print SDRs, so these special drawing rights. Think of it as world money. I mean, it is world money. They just gave it a geeky name so people wouldn't know what it is because world money sounds a little scary. But that's what it is, and that'll be the end of the dollar. So that's, that's how it plays out. That's the dynamic. Uh, what I want to do for readers is, first of all, explain really in, in scientific space what the problem is, how it's already there. We're just waiting for the snowflake. And then look kind of over the horizon as to what might come next. That was indeed. Apocalyptic, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned the IMF, and uh, I think that's a point in the book that a lot of people have um, found kind of controversial or interesting, uh, this idea that the reserve currency could, could kind of land there, either after the crisis or maybe in some sense instead of the crisis. Uh, what's your take on that? Is that, is that something that's uh, sort of 
a suboptimal but non-terrible outcome, or is that sort of ultimately just setting us up for the crisis after this one? Well, it's the only outcome that the power elites can envision. Um, and when I say power elites, you know, this is not some black helicopter conspiracy. I mean, they're real people. They're finance ministers, treasury secretary, central bankers, leading academics, policy makers. I mean, there's a real set of real people who run the international monetary system. And, uh, you know, I know some number of them, and that, that's what I mean by the, the policy elites. Um, I like to say the IMF is transparently non-transparent. And what I mean by that is they actually tell you everything they're doing. But the language is so arcane and so technical that you kind of have to work at the IMF to understand it. Um, I, um, you know, Garrett in the introduction mentioned that I went to the School of Advanced International Studies uh, right around the corner of Massachusetts Avenue. What he didn't say is that that school is intellectual boot camp for the IMF. When you graduate, you, you, you kind of three job, uh, you know, sort of something in the government, national security, maybe the banking system or the IMF. Uh, Tim Guythen was one of uh, our distinguished graduates. He had a, a nice brief career at the IMF. So I was sort of marinated in that uh, early in my career and maintained my interest in it. But um, there are very few people outside the IMF who actually understand what they do. Um, and the special drawing right is, uh, is a good example. Um, it's one of those names. That it's, it's a lot like the Federal Reserve in the following sense. Why is the Federal Reserve not called the Central Bank of the United States? I mean, it is the central bank of the United States. No one disputes that. Well, the answer is we had central banks twice before, and the American people hated it and got rid of them. And uh, in 1913, uh, the view of the elites was that, well, the American people really don't like central banks, so let's call it something else and see if we can slide it by. And they did, so they called it the Federal Reserve. The SDR is no different. Special drawing right. It's, it's world money. It's a fiat currency. Um, it, it's not complicated. I've met PhD-level economists who can't tell you what an SDR is. They haven't studied it or it's just a little bit off the run. But it's pretty simple. The Fed can print dollars. The European Central Bank can print euros. The IMF can print SDRs. Are they backed by anything? No. Now, you'll hear some sort of so-called experts say, oh, you know, it's a basket of currencies. It's the dollar, the euro, the Swiss franc, and all that. It's not. There is a basket that is used for purposes of calculating the value of an SDR, the notional value of an SDR, for exchange purposes. So you say, well, how much is an SDR worth? I mean, the answer is it's worth about $1.55. It, it fluctuates daily. The IMF, I'm on their mailing list. They'll send you an email every day to tell you what the, what the SDR is worth that day. It's about $1.55. But the so-called basket is just a bunch of currencies weighted, converted, and then added together to come up with a cross rate, but it's a numeraire. It's not backed by those currencies. It's not backed by anything. It's not meant to be. Um, and so it's just pre fiat money. So the, the question, Catherine, really is, so if the dollar fails, and when I say fail, what does that mean? It means that there's a loss of confidence, a near instantaneous widespread loss of confidence in the dollar as a store of value. It doesn't mean dollars literally disappear. What it means is that if you have them, you want to get rid of them. You want, you want to buy gold, you want to buy silver, land, fine art, or our friend Warren Buffett, who's out buying railroads, oil, gas, uh, oil and gas. Um, you know, Wa Warren Buffett is a guy who's dumping paper money as fast as he can. Um, one of his recent big acquisitions was the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Uh, and you know, your conventional wisdom is, oh, Warren Buffett likes transportation stocks. Well, no, he bought the whole thing. What is a railroad? A railroad is nothing but hard assets. It's right away, mining rights adjacent to the right away, rail, rolling stock, yards, switches, signals, buildings. It's all hard assets. How does a railroad make money? It moves hard assets as freight, coal, you know, corn, wheat, steel, cattle, as the case may be. So a railroad is a hard asset that makes money moving hard assets. Warren Buffett's next big acquisition was oil and natural gas resources. Uh, in Canada, and by the way, is kind of indifferent to the Keystone Pipeline because if you put 100 tank cars together, you got a pipeline on wheels, and he'll move his own oil and his own railroad to his own, uh, you know, refineries down the line. So he's a guy who's dumping paper money as fast as he can, getting into hard assets. And you go back to the Weimar Republic hyperinflation in 1922-23. It's an episode people are generally familiar with, and we all know who the losers were. You know, if you were middle class, you had savings. You had retirement, you had insurance, you had annuities, you had any kind of nominal income. You were wiped out, you were destroyed. But it wasn't all losers, there were a lot of winners. Who were the winners? If you were multinational and you had foreign currency coming in to Germany, if you had a factory, the currency can go to zero. A factory is still a factory, it's a valuable asset. 
some, uh, some folks had gold, and the winners went out and bought up all the losers and consolidated industrial holdings in Germany, and then they decided that this guy Hitler might be a nice pawn for them. That didn't quite work out, but, but you take the point. So, so I watch Buffett. When it comes to billionaires, don't do what they say. Watch what they do. Uh, and, and Buffett's getting at hard assets as fast as he can. So we'll still have dollars, but in this new world of SDRs, the dollar will be no different than the Turkish lira or the Mexican peso. It'll be a local currency. It'll be walking around money. So if you go out to dinner later tonight, you, you use dollars. But it won't be used for the big things. What do I mean by the big things? Price of oil, settlement of balance of payments between countries, probably the financial statements of the 100 largest corporations. So in the future, when you get your IBM or General Electric annual report in the mail, or Volkswagen or Siemens or SAP, it'll all be denominated in SDRs, you know, certified by uh, you know, Ernst & Young or whoever. And at that point, there'll be no turning back. The dollar will be just another, another local currency. So, by the way, in January 2011, the IMF published a paper. It's a 10-year plan to make the SDR the global reserve currency. They talk about what they need to do that. They need a bond market with diverse maturities. They need dealers repos, futures, options, the plumbing, so to speak, of the financial system. It's all there on the website. You don't have to uh, make it up. And then uh, two weeks ago on Sunday, it was April 13th, if I'm not mistaken, but whatever that Sunday was, um, there was a dry run for Bretton Woods. There was the annual, uh, not the annual, the semi-annual spring meeting of the IMF here in Washington. You had finance ministers, central bankers from around the world, and they always do, they do a little G20 on the side, and a little bricks on the side. Uh, and they have an agenda that runs from Friday, Friday night, Saturday. Well, Sunday, they had an unscheduled meeting. They disclosed the existence of the meeting and a few of the, the attendees, including the head of the Bank for National Settlements, that's the central bank or central bank, head of the Swiss National Bank, and other leading economists and figures. They didn't disclose who they were. I'll take a wild guess and guess that, you know, people like Barry Eichengreen and Mohammed al Arian were there. I'm not sure of that, but it seems like a good guess. But this was, and they explicitly said in the press release, to discuss the future of the international monetary system. So this was a dry run for New Bretton Woods. This is all in the air. It's all out there. It, I, I'll be the first to admit it's very little understood, but it's coming your way. So we're now going to make you the dictator of all things. Um, based on your performance here today and uh, your books, whatever. Uh, uh, what, what's the better system? What, what do we do instead? This, this sounds bleak, so okay. fix it. Well, well, Catherine, your first question was, what, give me the apocalyptic scenario. Now I'll give you some uh, good news. It's, it's not too late to fix the system. It is a question of policy. We're not helpless. Um, you know, when I ended currency wars, I explicitly said, it's late, but it's not too late. There are a set of things we can do. The death of money ends on a slightly more Pessim I'll say pessimistic note, which kind of says, it may be too late to save the system, but it's not too late to save yourself and your family and your, your personal net worth. But just to kind of walk that back a little bit, if you did want to try to save the system, as late as it is, there are very explicit things you can do. First of all, ban most derivatives. Not all of them. I think the Chicago Exchange Trade of Futures are, they've been around for 150 years. I think they're relatively safe and sound. Um, but uh, but the, you know the the over the counter off balance sheet swaps books, which are the the biggest part of the problem, um, mainly because they're understood by professionals using um, uh, methods that misapprehend the statistical properties of risk. They're understood by professionals as creating net exposure, which is not the right way to think about it. And it's not just a preference. It's you know dynamically you would look at the gross exposure. When AIG failed, nobody was worried about the net exposure on their books, they were worried about the gross amount that AIG owed them. So you go through this very kind of quick phase transition or you know, conditional correlation where what was a net exposure on a sunny day becomes a gross exposure when you're in financial distress. So you have to think about the gross exposure. Nobody on Wall Street does. Um, and if you said, um, for example, we're going to triple the size of the derivatives books on Wall Street, which they've done uh, since 2008, we're going to triple them, how much did the risk go up? Uh, well, if you stop Jamie Dimon on the street, if you could get close to him, and by the way, he knows nothing about risk. He's, a, he's kind of a type A process engineer. He knows how to merge companies and create some economies of scale. Really doesn't understand risk at all. Uh, he would probably say that if you triple the system, the risk went up very little because it's you know long, short, long, short, long, short. You net it all out. It comes down to some net, net number that's fairly small. Um, if you ask my mother, my 83-year-old mother, she's quite bright. She's not an economist. 
uh, said, Mom, I tripled the system. How much did the risk go up? She would probably use intuition and say, well, you probably tripled the risk, you know, a nice linear function. Mom's wrong, too. Uh, the correct answer is if you triple the size of the system, you increase the risk by a factor of 10, maybe 100. No, it's an exponential function, and that's what we're doing. Um, so that's the, kind of, that's the kind of risk that's uh, out there. So what should you do about it? Well, first of all, uh, ban those derivatives, make them unwind them as fast as they can, break up the big banks. When I started in banking, J.P. Morgan today was five banks. It was the old J.P. Morgan, it was Chase Manhattan, Chemical, Manufacturers Hanover, and I think Wachovia is in there at this point. And there might be a couple, bank bond, there might be a couple other banks, but it was five or six banks, all of which were large. Break it up. Get them back to being five or six banks. It doesn't mean they can't fail. It just means if they do fail, it doesn't matter because they're not that big. They're not as systemically important as J.P. Morgan. Um, the other thing is bring back Glass-Steagall. You know, here's what happened. In the 1920s, bankers decided that it was a good idea to originate garbage loans, package them up, and sell them to their customers. That You could make a lot of money doing that. They, they opened retail offices throughout the country, and they did that. And guess what? They all failed. We had a market crash. Investors lost their money. And Congress had hearings, um, the PCORA Commission and other hearings in, um, in 1933 and 1934. And Congress looked at that and said, ah, we have a very simple solution. We're going to say from now on, you can do one of two things. You can take deposits and make commercial loans. That's fine. Or you can underwrite and sell securities. But you cannot do both because there's an, an inherent conflict of interest. If you are taking deposits and using that to create securities that have garbage in them and selling them to your customers, that's a temptation you can't resist. That's a conflict of interest. So you can be a commercial bank or you can be an investment bank. That was the law for 65 years until 1999. And then uh, Phil Graham and a few others came along and the, for some reason the Congress in 1999 thought that they were smarter than the Congress of 1933. I find no empirical evidence for that. In fact, there's evidence for the opposite, because they thought, well, it's the modern age, we're a lot smarter, we got computers and all this stuff. They repealed Glass-Steagall. Well, guess what? Within, Im immediately, the banks started originating garbage assets and selling them to their customers, exactly what they had done in the 1920s. And is it any surprise that by 2007, the entire system collapsed again, exactly as it, as it had in 1929? So it was, you know, how many times do you have to get hit in the head with a two by four to wake up and realize that that conflict of interest is not going away? And you need to um, uh, you need to, to put it back. So, by the way, Glass Steagall was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, kind of 15 or 20 pages. I think Dodd Frank was 1,800 pages, uh, and no one no one's read it. Uh, but uh, so all you had so put back Glass Steagall. Um, we had just as a quick aside, we had a near catastrophe, a near complete global failure of the system in 1998. I know I was there, I was the general counsel of long-term capital management, which was the entity at the heart of this particular crisis. We were, we were on the phone to the Fed, the Treasury. We were hours away from every market in the world not opening. I'm not saying you know, maybe they opened a week later, but they were, they were all going, not going to open. Every market was going to fail uh, until, on Tuesday, September 29th. Uh, but Wall Street cobbled together $4 billion. We stuck it on the balance sheet made an announcement, created confidence, the Fed cut the discount rate, uh, they cut it again in your meeting and somehow stability was restored. Now if you looked at that, and I did look at it, I was there, um, you would draw a set of conclusions. You'd say, you know, we really ought to ban derivatives. Uh, we really ought not to let the banks get mixed up in this. Uh, we really ought to reduce leverage. Those, those should have been your three takeaways from a near, near global collapse. Instead, what happened in the next four years? Policy did the opposite. They repealed Glass-Steagall, so they let the banks become hedge funds. They repealed swaps regulation in 2000 so that you could do right swaps on anything. Uh, Basel, uh, Basel II uh, allowed the banks to increase leverage, and then finally the SEC did their part by repealing or amending uh, Rule 15C31, which is the net capital requirement, so you could leverage 30 to 1 instead of 15 to 1. It, it, you know, an average bright grad student could have seen the crisis coming. In fact. You know, I did, others did, and then some of them did, because it was a toxic mix, the exact opposite of what you would have recommended. So I would say, put the genie back in the bottle, bring back Glass Steagall, break up the big banks, ban derivatives, reduce leverage, uh, and that way you'll still have, you know, morons and you'll still have failures, but they won't take down the world. All right, we're going to do a quick lightning round. Okay. Uh, yes, no questions, and a couple of sentences and answers, and then we'll take 
questions from the audience. Uh, first, yes, no question. Uh, do you consider yourself a follower of the Austrian school? I'm a complexity theorist, and if um, Ludwig van Mies were alive today, he would be one too. <laughs> that is a lightning round answer, my friend. Uh, you're involved with Singularity University. How does that dovetail with what, uh, what you've just talked about today? You get the smartest people in the world uh, all in one room. It's an amazing phenomena. Um, it's uh, you know, it, it's sort of it's the the brain people and the money people at like a, a mixer. You know, so that's one way to describe it. But uh, it really is uh, impressive. Uh, actually, that's one of the things that gives me confidence. I'm very pessimistic about a lot of things, but when you meet some of these, you know, new idea entrepreneur people, there's a little bit of encouragement there. Uh, you've said that an ideal portfolio should contain 10% uh, fine art. Why? Um, fine art behaves the way gold would behave if central banks didn't manipulate it, uh, which means it performs very well. Janet Yellen does not wake up in the morning and say, you know, we really got to crush the art market today. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good proxy for gold without the volatility. Student loans are the new subprime mortgages? Question mark? Uh, I take away the question mark. There's one trillion of them. By the way, as I discussed it in my book, not only are they the new, first of all, we're creating a generation of debt slaves. Um, you know, the number of 20, really bright, 23, 24 year olds you meet who just graduated from an Ivy League or elite university, they've got $200,000 in debt, no job, and they're living in mom and dad's attic, uh, and they can't pay their student loans. By the way, there are two and only two debts that you cannot discharge in bankruptcy. Bank bankruptcy is the all-American system. It's like we all make mistakes. People borrow too much, things don't work out as planned. You get to wipe the slate clean in a fair way and make a fresh start. That's, that's the American way, and you, you do it again, you know. So that's what bankruptcy, but there are two things you can't get rid of in bankruptcy. One is taxes. Well, that makes sense, right? It'd be too easy to get rid of your taxes. The other one is student loans. So you can't get rid of them. If you can't pay them, what happens? Your credit rating deteriorates. Try getting a job with a bad credit rating because employers are doing background checks and they use credit ratings as an addition of people who will steal from them so they won't hire you. Try getting an apartment, same thing. So now we got our best and our brightest. They're debt slaves, can't get out from under, can't get a job, can't get an apartment. What a great system. Why are we doing this? Because this is a backdoor off-budget way for the Treasury to pump hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's upwards of a trillion dollars now, into the system without congressional appropriation and with to students who have the highest propensity to spend of anyone I can think of. And where does the money go? It goes to union faculty and union administrators who raise the price. So this is, this is a, a disgrace. Um, you know, as, as I say, let's give the students, you know, college is expensive, let's give them a loan. Well, all the colleges do is raise the price. So the students know further ahead, except they got two more zeros on their, on their, uh, on the, on the liability side of their balance sheet and the union um, unionized universities are taking all the money and the treasury is pumping them out. So this is a backdoor stimulus program that's in, oh, by the way, you can get up on your student loans if you take a government approved job. There are all kinds of, you know, we'll cap your interest payments, we'll forgive it after 10 years, but please do what we tell you. Final question, can Bitcoin save us all? Uh, we'll see if Bitcoin can save itself. Um, the, here's my, my two least favorite topics are Bitcoin and Tesla because the, the people who believe in them are impervious to any kind of, they, they're just, they take it to heart and you can't kind of have, hard to have a good debate. But uh, on a serious note, I, I'm not anti-Bitcoin. I'm, I'm pro-technology. I've actually been dragged into enough of gold versus Bitcoin debates. I've had to study all the Bitcoin papers and the scientific papers and actually know it fairly well. Um, I'm all for it. Um, it. It's cool. It's distributed. It's open source. Uh, it's robust. It's encrypted. Uh, it's useful. It's cheap. It's got a lot of things going for it. Uh, so by all means, if people want to transact in bit Bitcoins, that's fine. I don't own them. I don't recommend them to investors. A couple of reasons. Number one, Bitcoin has not been through a business cycle. It was invented in 2009. Uh, we've only been in a growth cycle since then. It's, it's an anemic, weak, pitiful growth cycle, but it hasn't been a down market hasn't been a technical recession. So we don't know how Bitcoin performs in that environment. Um, and there, it's enormously volatile. I mean, the, you know, the cross rate between the dollar and the euro, it's actively traded. It moves, you know, fractions of a penny. They, they measure uh, changes in the foreign exchange market to four decimal places of a dollar. So that's how 
Um, uh, you know, if, if it moves a couple in one day, that's, that's volatile. Bitcoin, you know, will go from 300 to 400 to 500, down to 175, back up to 600. It's, you know, fasten your seatbelt, but it's a little too volatile for my taste. But I have nothing against it. I wouldn't ban it. I, I like uh, cool technology. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I think we better end there. Uh, feel free to come up and mob Jim with your questions afterward. Um, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>